Morning, everybody. We'll get started uh, as promptly as close to 11 as we can. Um, uh, my name is Peter Cleary. I'm a principal here at Santa's Health. I'm, I'm happy that uh, uh, you're, you're here to join us as we talk through the election that is within its first week. Um, we'll talk through some health policy, uh, what it means for the parties. Perhaps we'll get into some existing policies that the government was working on as the, as the election was launched and what might happen to those. Uh, and uh, and a bit of uh, a bit of a spicy conversation around communications in the campaign and what it might mean for you. So, uh, I think Thomas, you're controlling the slides. So, if you could just advance them, that'd be great. Uh, so, I'm joined with my uh, colleagues Stephanie Ga uh, Stephanie Gower and, and Laura Mandel, uh, both focusing on uh, uh, government relations with with uh, Stephanie and communications with Laura. Um, we're really excited that Laura's joined our teams to spearhead our, our communications practice and. And, uh, and she'll give you a flavor of, of what she thinks of this campaign as the, as the presentation here today uh, um, moves forward. Uh, if you don't already know, and I suspect you do, Santa's Health is a health and life sciences consultant, consultancy focusing solely in the healthcare sector. Um, we're pleased to support clients ranging from communications to public policy advice, government relations and management consulting. Um, and we're really excited to be able to talk about this topic with you today because as all political nerds uh, that predominantly uh, find themselves in consultancies, um, we uh, love election time and we love being able to pontificate and speculate and give you our best assessment of what we think is happening and what it means uh, to you. So with that, uh, we'll keep moving forward here. I think I already highlighted what we're going to talk about today, so we'll keep rolling past this. Uh, and Steph, I'll, I'll let you uh, kick it off here. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everyone. It's Stephanie Gower. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as with most of our, our webinars, we like to start off with some polling as a bit of a level set. And uh, I, I think that the polling has been really interesting to watch over the last month uh, leading up to the election with all the speculation and all the, the major parties gearing up. Um, I would say the Liberals had a solid lead in July and things have really tightened up quite a bit during the first week of the campaign. And it's uh, in my opinion, definitely a difficult road to uh, the majority, I think, that they had hoped for. Um, Canadians are also really divided on whether or not we should be actually holding an election during the pandemic. And 56% of Canadians, according to Ipsos, are saying now is not the right time. Many Canadians feel the focus should remain on COVID-19 recovery, uh, supporting uh, all the Canadians that are affected by the wildfires, and focusing on international issues such as Afghanistan. Uh, new polling is released uh, weekly, and with most of the new polls covering the first week of the campaign that should be released uh, this weekend. So I suspect we'll see that gap closing uh, between the CPC and the Liberals. Um, you know, keeping in mind, most of these polls are really within the margin of error right now. So that means a, a fairly tight race. Next slide, please. So what does, the, what does this all mean and what does the pandemic sort of, how does that impact the election? And I think new data from um, Angus Reid today actually shows that majority of Canadians, 58%, uh, feel more anxious than they do hopeful about the country's near-term economic future. Um, and interestingly, the top two issues um, in that poll also found that they're the same issues as the 2019 campaign, so climate change, and healthcare, uh, COVID-19 is, is sort of rounding out the top three. Um, the Liberals and the NDP enter this election with the advantage of having a leader in place pre-pandemic. The CPC leader, Aaron O'Toole, you know, coming into this still relatively unknown across Canada, um, only being elected last year as leader of the party. Um, but some recent polling uh, from Angus Reid shows that when Canadians think specifically about who is best to handle the growing um, economy post-pandemic, O'Toole and the CPC uh, are, are at 41%, while the Liberals are around 36%. So I think taking us back to sort of that traditional uh, CPC um, economic uh, you know, focus. The polling is also really interesting to watch, and I would encourage everyone to watch it over the weekend um, just to see how the after effects of the Nova Scotia election impact the federal race. Uh, many, many pundits and media have commented on sort of the perils of calling a snap election for, for no good reason. Um, and if the results of the Nova Scotia election will have the federal liberals really wondering if this is um, the same thing will happen to them on, on September 20th. And I think, you know, at this point, only time will tell. So now I'll pass things back to Peter to, to really get into the policy areas. 
Yeah, and I, I failed to go through housekeeping items. I was so excited to start the webinar. Um, a couple of things, you'll see a poll pop up on your screen sometimes. We're gonna walk through the polling res results with this group at the, at the end of the presentation when we have time for questions. Um, two, we will be making this uh, webinar uh, available publicly. Uh, you'll get an email, if, uh, since you registered, you'll get an email with a copy of it, uh, allowing you to share it around and it, and it will be up on our website. And, uh, and three, we'll also uh, accompany that with a bit of a survey uh, so we can get thoughts and advice from you in terms of what we could do differently, better, or topics that perhaps you didn't hear that you would like to hear as we continue to build out these opportunities to uh, hear from our team. So uh, with those housekeeping items, I'll flip to the next slide, please. Uh, so the federal liberals right now, they don't yet have a policy platform release. They're um, of, the, of the three, let's say, major parties. They're, they're the last ones to do it. However, we do have six years of government that we can lean on and some commitments that they're already up in the window that are of interest to a lot of the folks on this call. So I'm gonna try and give an assessment of uh, what they have been focusing on and perhaps what, what will happen to items if, uh, if the Liberals win or if they don't win uh, to some of these. So with that, let's, let's get rolling. I should mention, and, and we'll refer to uh, Abacus a couple times here, uh, they did some interesting polling. Um, there seems to be a level of apathy, I would suspect, uh, when, you, when an individual refers to how is the health system working for them. Um, this sense that uh, you know, it's working as, as best as it possibly could have bookshelved by uh, more extreme uh, opinions in terms of working very well, but, but not at all. Uh, I, would, I would say that 20% you know, of the population not believing the healthcare system is working well for them is, is a very high uh, number. And arguably speaking, it's, it's, that's, the, that's the area or the number of people that are probably using the system uh, the most. The vast majority of the population like myself, I'm, you know, I should I say middle-aged? Let's just say I'm middle-aged, relatively healthy. I don't access it. Uh, those who do access it are probably the ones who, who find, find uh, challenges towards it. So with that in mind, uh, we'll keep rolling. Uh, the federal government under the Liberals, uh, you would have seen, uh, seen this commitment time and time again uh, since 2019 in particular. Uh, they want to move forward with a pharmacare program as it relates to health policy. There's active discussions in terms of what a Canada drug agency could look like um, and what a national formulary could look like, which would, which would ultimately uh, be uh, managed by the agency uh, if the government uh, is reelected and, and sticks to what they've, they've said to in the past. In addition to a national strategy for uh, rare drugs, the government's moving away from this high cost uh, drug language. So I haven't seen them entirely move away from it, but that's something that the government has heard that it, it, it's not perhaps the right framing uh, and put money up in the window starting in 2022. So let's talk through these and, and let's see where, where perhaps they'll sit um, if the liberals are not reelected or if they are. Next slide. Um, pharmacare. Uh, child care took over as the penultimate uh, priority. Um, you know, Pharmacare went from the front page of the budget to the uh, last two thirds of, of the budget this time uh, around. Um, it's still a continued commitment. I suspect that uh, the Liberals have had a hard time um, dropping it. Uh, and I do think they probably talked about dropping it because there's been such little um, activity towards it. Uh, but this government, I, I think one of the reasons they lost the majority in 2019 is uh, because they, they did um, push away progressive voters that they won in 2015. I think that uh, not proceeding with democratic reform hurt them in a lot of Ontario ridings uh, where they uh, were getting NDP vote in 2015 and, and it went back to the NDP in, in 2019. Uh, it would be really tough for the Liberals to drop this again. And, and it was clear that they wanted to show some sort of tangible effort towards the commitment, which is why such a small um, uh, funding uh, pot was announced for PEI prior to days before the election call. It was 30 or 35 million to uh, decrease the uh, copay on the generic program that, that PEI has, uh, as well as uh, uh, look to expand their formulary. And, and I would say that, and this will, we'll get to this in the next slide, I would say that that sort of investment to a province, the Liberals may call it universal pharmacare, national universal pharmacare, but that is essentially a closing the gap model. They are giving provinces money to do as they see fit to uh, address the insured and the underinsured, um, uh, as, as, as we could probably define it. So we'll go to the next slide, and, and I think we have another Angus Reid poll that kind of talks about what Canadians believe. Um, 
Uh, do they support a fill the gaps? Do they support a plan for all? And I would, I would argue that the Liberal Party uh, has a plan for all by filling the gaps, if I can talk in a roundabout way. Uh, I would further argue that the Conservatives and Liberals are probably closer on this issue than the NDP are. Uh, if PEI is truly what would be replicated across the country if the Liberals were re-elected. Uh, the only difference between the Conservatives and the Liberals is that the Liberals would probably try and push for a bit more of a commitment in terms of where that funding would actually go versus the Conservatives who would just trust the provinces and turn the money over to the provinces, whether it's within the existing health transfer or more. I wouldn't know the answer to that at this point in time. Um, next slide. On the Canada Drug Agency itself, I think because of this languishing vision in terms of what Pharmacare is or the fact that Pharmacare isn't a big uh, program as perhaps we were led to believe in 2019, um, the CDA needs to find a path forward. What, you know, what is the problem it's trying to solve? Uh, what do their, you know, arguably from a government standpoint, and this might get me in trouble, but from a government standpoint, they probably look at the provinces as their most important constituency since they have the jurisdiction, uh, have, a, have the majority jurisdiction in, in terms of healthcare, healthcare delivery. Um, I think I think the federal government needs to get a sense of what is within the federal apparatus that that could be improved. What is the opportunity? What is the risk? And uh, what do provinces and territories want? Um, I think there's a broader stretch goal that you could get the CDA, CDA involved in in uh, in pricing, and and that is the vision that was laid out in the PG4A Dr. Daniel Martin report, the Pan Canadian Health Organization report, which is around 2019, 2020 when that was put out. Maybe 2018, 2019. It's been a while now. Um, but the reality is that if the if the federal uh, if the liberals were reelected, um, they could pour uh, some energy into this, and and the bureaucracy is already vested with the development of this through a transition office led by Susan Fitzpatrick. I would argue if the Conservatives won, um, it may be seen as something that is probably a bureaucratic uh, uh, structural um, waste. Uh, provinces and territories haven't necessarily come out uh, boldly in support of it. Uh, and without a, a clear vision for it, I think that uh, the CDA's life would be short-lived under a conservative government. That's not necessarily true for uh, some of the other uh, some of the other things, though. So, with that, next slide. Cadathan and national formulary. So, Cadath themselves, uh, um, uh, those on this call will know, is 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 its own en entity in in many ways. Um, they have their own strategic plan and, and priorities that will come into effect in April, and, and that will carry on regardless of uh, a liberal and conservative government. I think the priorities of that government may influence them, but that is in, in, in itself uh, their strategy. The interesting um, development here is prior to the election, uh, CADF is moving forward with their steering committee and anticipated consultations later this fall in terms of what a national formulary could look like. Um, they're not policymakers. Uh, in they, you know, they don't decide and set the policy. It looks like it would be uh, at the end of the day when when all is said and done, uh, sometime in the spring, recommendations would be delivered to Health Canada in terms of what that uh, national formulary could look like. Um, uh, I think you could you could imagine if this were a uh, a reelected Liberal government. Um, oh goodness, uh, it's anybody's guess if if this sits on a shelf or something's actually done with it. But it would probably be. be uh, reflected on potentially uh, and used more um, under a liberal government, especially as they they think through their financial levers to achieve a policy objective. Um, under the Conservatives, unless there is a, a big call from provinces and territories or from their core constituency that this is needed, it's likely something that would be uh, accepted recommendations to government, but I, I do not suspect that it would um, uh, get a lot of uh, time and day in a, in a Health Canada led by a, a Conservative cabinet minister. Uh, Next slide. PMPRB, I, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, uh, I, think, I think whoever comes into government will have to deal with this file uh, without a doubt. Um, uh, patient groups have had a dynamic relationship. Some patient groups, I should say, have had a dynamic relationship with the PMPRB over the last couple of months in how the PMPRB characterized them in, in some internal uh, communications. Um, right or wrong, it was, it was, pretty, it was a pretty dumb move on, on the PMPRB's part. Um, they're also moving forward with new guidelines, uh, which uh, many on this webinar will likely be submitting uh, to that consultation period that wraps up August 31st. Uh, interestingly, that still continues during an election, uh, but uh, the reality is they're allowed accepting feedback. They're just, they're just not gonna make any decisions during the campaign period. 
And I think the PMPRB issue will will land on uh, a land on a new government, liberal or conservative. Um, I should I should give a shout out, maybe NDP. Who knows? Um, I don't think so, but but to be fair, um, but whoever forms government will have to deal with this file. You have regulations that are not in force. You have new guidelines uh, that the PMPRB wants to move forward with. In the event that the regulations are never put into force, you have uh, multiple court cases. Uh, and you have commitments from a, the government to lower drug prices um, uh, in, in over the cloud of uh, of a court case uh, articulating recently uh, that it's not the PMPRB's role to determine uh, what reasonable prices are for drugs. Um, so I, I don't suspect this file will go away, and it will have to be dealt with by any government that comes into uh, that comes into power on September twentieth. Next slide. So for long-term care, I believe the Prime Minister is up in Victoria on this today, and if we're, um, we're on the call right now, uh, if, if that announcement's happening now, I apologize that I don't have up to date in terms of the specifics of that, that announcement, but I actually think long-term care is a really big opportunity for um, the federal Liberals, if they so choose to jump on board it, uh, to articulate that um, the federal government used their spending power to improve the conditions of long-term care across the board. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, they only have uh, spending par power. It's fraught with uh, complex policy challenges given how the long-term care system is structured in provinces. My best experience is, uh, is, on, is Ontario. Um, I think that uh, the challenge with long-term care is that it was very um, focused on when the issues were front and center. Um, but as time goes on, it is not as prevalent on Canadian minds for whatever reason. Um, and uh, the world in which the federal government can uh, spark action, um, I don't think is, uh, is uh, I think is limited. Um, having said that, the federal government has spending power that they can put towards um, trying to achieve some level of outcome in return for money from provinces and territories. It will be interesting to see how much further the, the federal Liberals will try and go on that front, in addition to the nearly $4 billion that they are uh, transferring uh, to provinces for long-term care and seniors care uh, just, since, just since this spring. Next slide. And then without a Liberal platform, uh, let's, let's be honest, there's a wide range of commitments they have on here, um, whether it's health transfers, um, uh, seniors long-term care, we, we talked about briefly, mental health and addictions has been a, a profiled uh, issue that this, this government was working on uh, back in 2015 during my time there. Um, emergency preparedness, uh, the, I, I would kind of bucket that in with uh, some of their uh, biomanufacturing strategy that they've talked about. Uh, rare drugs is another one that they have money that they're they're is set to flow next year, but they don't actually know how that funding is going to roll out. That consultation is ongoing. That's another one I would suspect would continue under a conservative government. It's um it's something I think those two parties agree on is is the space of rare drugs and the conservatives prior to 2015 in government actually put a put a, a focus on this that uh, didn't pan out, but but it's still a, an issue that's important to them. The one thing I would say, and, and uh, the one thing that kind of irks me and bugs me as a political, as a as a political and health policy nerd, is the lack of um, uh, debate from any party around what the public health system needs. Um, it reminds me of what it was it, what what it was like coming out of uh, SARS uh, and the the reports and reviews, uh, which we don't even have at a federal level right now. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some parties, especially as we get closer to election day and and the population wakes up and this campaign gets spicier after election day. I wouldn't be surprised if you start hearing from the Conservatives, especially that they do a, a significant uh, review of uh, a pandemic preparedness. Um, so I think with that, I should probably pass it over to uh, Steph to start talking through um, uh, where the opposition's at. Thanks, Peter. Uh, before I do that, um, if you have a question for us, you can either enter it into the chat or use the Q&A function. Um, we've already received uh, a few questions and we'll endeavor to answer those as we go. And at the end, there will be time for that. But please feel free to ask your questions. Uh, next slide, please, Thomas. We can jump right into it. Next slide. Um, so it's it's been an interesting week for the Conservatives, and as of today, the CPC and the NDP have released their real and detailed set of policy prescriptions uh, in their platforms. And it's interesting, actually, because they did it right right away, right at the beginning of the campaign. Um, the CPC platform this week gained a lot of attention, I think, for a few reasons. Uh, platforms, as I said, aren't typically released this early on in the campaign. 
Uh, neither the CPC nor the NDP documents are costed. They're leaving that up to the uh, parliamentary budget officer to do that. Um, and uh, on the conservative side, the cover of the platform received a, little, a lot of attention with the leader Aaron O'Toole featured in a, a magazine style sort of cover, uh, reminiscent of the, uh, the platform for the new premier of Nova Scotia as well, uh, trying something a little bit different. Um, the, the CPC platform uh, focuses on a few main areas in terms of, of health care, but uh, COVID-19 recovery, uh, this document was actually released a little bit ahead of the platform being released. Um, and, uh, you know, I think stakeholder engagement was a, it was a big piece on this uh, for the Conservatives. Um, so the COVID-19 recovery uh, chunk that's in the platform was actually released a few weeks in advance, as, as well as the Canadian Mental Health Action Plan. Uh, mental health has been a big priority for um, Aaron O'Toole and the CPC, uh, focusing, um, I, I've seen a few speeches this week already, uh, as this being the focus, um, and as well launched at the sort of party convention. Uh, that we had a, a few months ago. Um, the, you know, Conservatives are obviously interested in um, the health transfers um, and raising the annual growth rate on that, and also a fairly large piece in the platform on, on the medical uh, assistance in dying um, and, uh, you know, changing a few or reversing a few of the provisions under Bill C-7 that we saw. Uh, next slide, please. The um, NDP as well released their platform. I would say it's a bit different. It's it's a commitments based sort of party on their party website. No costing attached. Um, and uh, upon review, many of these commitments are the same that we we've seen from the NDP in in 2019. Uh, most recently, and I think we had a question about this uh, as well. Most recently, the NDP announced their pledge to expand domestic manufacturing capacity. But I you know I would say that the announcement comes without dollar figures, uh, very few specifics. Um, and when pressed by the media, the leader um, really just said that it's going to be an aggressive strategy to support companies looking to expand domestically and investing in those business. So fairly, fairly light on details from the NDP. Um, and uh, Peter, I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to add on on uh, the NDP. Um, no, not really. The The platform that they released is, is a carbon copy of 2019, uh, which, which I'm not trying to present as a, as a bad thing, but, uh, but rather it will kind of give you a really, really good sense of, of where they were and where they are, which is a consistent set of uh, priorities. Um, the, one, the one weakness um, as a health policy nerd is, is a lot of the time the NDP promises um, uh, something that, that on health in particular that doesn't fall within federal jurisdiction. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it won't play in local communities. I, I recall in 2019, the NDP promising a, a hospital for Brampton. Um, so, it, so you could see them try and uh, do announcements like that um, from a retail um, a poli politics standpoint as they target a couple of ridings that they're either trying to hold or potentially pick up. Next slide, please. And, and I think Peter and I will have a few things to say about the Green Party, but uh, it's uh, it's very um, sort of there. There is no detailed platform from the Green Party at this point. Few detailed commitments, and the leader is clearly focused on securing her her own riding um, as a priority after the substantial sort of infighting that we've been seeing uh, with this party. Um, you know, we were we were discussing it earlier. This will likely benefit the NDP nationally. Um, so it'll just be interesting to watch, but but so far um, the Green Party is really just focused on uh, you know securing the the current writings that they have. Peter, anything else you want to add? I mean, um, right now the the Green Party leader is is focused on Toronto Centre uh, and and probably uh, to the detriment of the party at large. I, I think they've really turned their campaign in, into holding the two seats they have and. And the leader really focusing on trying to pick up Toronto Centre. I, I don't think it's a strategy that's going to pan out. I think it's it's going to hurt the NDP numbers overall, or not the NDP, the Green numbers overall. Uh, and and there'll be a slice of vote that um, both the the Liberals and the NDP can benefit from uh, across the country, uh, particularly the NDP. Uh, the the Liberals in in 2019 were very concerned about the combined NDP Green vote. Um, that's the number that they generally look at is, is what that is at. So, you know, the NDP might be at, uh, you know, 17 to 20%, uh, which the Liberals can manage in terms of keeping seats from the Conservatives. 
But if you have the Greens polling at six, seven, eight, nine, uh, it makes for a lot of ridings that the Conservatives can slip through. So watch the combined NDP Liberal vote, uh, or sorry, the uh, combined Green NDP vote. And interestingly, if you dig a little bit deeper on, on Green Party voters, uh, they, they have a lot of allegiances as well with, with policies that Conservatives uh, actually align with as well too. Great. Um, I think we can jump into the next slide. And I'll turn things over. Oh, sorry, maybe, Peter. Maybe, Steph, before um, we turn over to Laura, there's a there's couple, couple things we want to, to flag, and, and one I probably should have done earlier is, as, as we have this discussion about health, health policy and as you were thinking about how to engage in, in the campaign or not or post-campaign, and, and Laura will kind of get into some of those, some of those thoughts, um, we would just want, want to be cognizant that you should view this next section of the presentation in light of the um, uh, rules and obligations that you might have to the Canada Revenue Agency if you're a registered charity, um, the requirements for, for Elections Canada to, to, um, uh, uh, that, that would force you to disclose spending on, on advocacy and advertisements uh, during the campaign, and then your traditional lobby efforts, um, uh, your requirements on that front, especially if you personally are deciding to help out a particular candidate what that might mean if that individual wins. So if you wanna talk more about that with any of our team, we're more than happy, but as we kind of move into this next section, we just want to frame up that uh, that you you should be uh, cognizant of those requirements that your organization or corporation has. So Laura, over to you. Great, thank you, Peter. And yeah, that's a, that's a great way to preface. We're going to shift gears a bit and we're gonna talk about communications during the election, yours and the party uh, and the parties. And if we can shift to the next slide. So as Peter said, really first everything, first confirm what you can, can't do and say. If you can, you'll wanna be leveraging your current channels to talk to your audience. You wanna help them understand the potential impacts and be a resource for them. So this means explaining the issues and the outcomes that are high on your radar, what's important, why it should matter to them, what information they need to know or what actions might they wanna take. And what different outcomes could mean corresponding to the different party platforms. This is really your chance to be a resource and to lay out the realities of what each scenario means and what you're doing in relation to those potential scenarios that is relevant to them. This could be a communication and a mobilization opportunity. You'll want to leverage your current vehicles and your communications channels to engage in what is already the news of the day. And that might be via uh, just a few examples that are listed here, social media, e-newsletters, emails, webinars, virtual meetings, town halls. If you, for any reason, don't have those channels set up now, you'll wanna get on that right away, picking just a couple that you can service really well and that consistently, uh, that you can consistently service and that best speak to where the eyes and the ears are that matter most to you. We can shift to the next slide. Next slide, thanks. So when an election is taking place, naturally there's a sentiment that messages can't break through the media landscape. There's too much noise, it's all about this one thing. But this really isn't a time to break through, it's actually a time to pile on and become part of the stories are be that are being told. On the media relations front, this is a time for newsjacking, for jumping on the coattails of stories that are already taking center stage by providing commentary and adding depth to the discussions underway. You can demonstrate your thought leadership. You can share insights, the solutions you offer. This is a time that you can show your relevance and impact, and you can do that by leveraging the news that is already in the spotlight. Likewise, getting your key messages out there in a way that demonstrates to the parties how you matter to them, how you can help them have the impact that they're seeking. And putting a face on the issues with stories about real people is always the way to go if you're looking to bring otherwise abstract issues to life telling the story of how someone is struggling or succeeding because of something that is or is not is a common connector. If you can put a face on your message or on the issue or platform as it re relates to your purpose and position, you'll want to do that. Next slide, please. So what's different this time around? We cannot lose sight of the fact that due to the pandemic, Canadians have been home over the past year and a half consuming more media. This means all the parties are dealing with a savvier media consumer and they will have to compete for attention with content that's compelling, dynamic, that cuts through all the other content that's pulling attention these days. And you can see 
that we've seen an increase in the viewing of streamed video content to the tune of 48.4% by Canadians as compared to before the pandemic. So what could this mean? Well, it means that people have gotten used to consuming content that is convenient for them. They've honed preferences for where they get their news and information and entertainment. They're used to quickly digestible trailers and succinct recaps and increasingly interactive live sports. And the competitive landscape for TV viewing really has just changed a lot since the last election. We should expect to see some interesting commercials in all directions, likely with solid production values and strong reaction factors. And these are things to keep in mind for your own communication strategies as well. Next slide, please. So a bit more about our, our digitally savvy voters. Older voters are more digitally savvy and engaged more than they were in that way uh, last election. They're using Skype, Zoom, FaceTime, uh, they've been engaged on virtual medicine and recreation programs. They're adapting to QR code use through phase reopening. They're on social media and consuming more content from more channels than before the pandemic, and certainly since the last election. So some stats here highlight that use. And it's important to note that 18% indicate the pandemic was the first time they'd used video conferencing, while 29% have used it more often. And with growing comfort in this uh, older demographic, growing comfort comes more choice in accessing information. Aligned with that, second and third screen tendencies have grown. So who among us hasn't Googled while watching a show or a sports match? Uh, media consumption has and is changing. People are looking for the news and the information behind the news and information in real time. So in the context of healthcare issues, platforms, and associated coverage, this really just reinforces the opportunity to add to the pool of information available to voters who will be actively seeking it out. Next slide, please. Summarizing what that all means, it means the traditional established media channels are not the only way voters will be getting their election news and the information, and they're taking it all in at an increasingly rapid pace in real time across multiple screens. This means the parties can't rely on the power of traditional media alone. Attention spans are lower, options for information are higher, and all parties will have to work harder to have the their eyes, ears, and actions spread across many more platforms. Voters will be actively seeking out multiple sources for information. Next slide, please. With all of that in mind, we're taking a brief look here at the social media channels for the parties. This table shows you which channels are active for which parties, and from strictly a follower count perspective, who has the largest number of followers on each of the three, <clears throat> excuse me, key, uh, key uh, social media platforms for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All the parties have those covered along with YouTube. And you can see the Liberals and NDP are on Flickr, and only the Liberals are on Snapchat. And this is as based on the party websites and the social media options provider, provided to visitors to those official websites. So it's worth noting, for example, that NDP leader Jagmeet Singh is on TikTok to the tune of 723,000 plus uh, followers, but the link is actually not provided on the official party website. Uh, next slide, please. So the key takeaways from that social media scan, while we can see at an initial glance which party leads for followers, there's more to that story. So on Facebook, the conservatives are leading the parties with a number of Facebook followers, but the PM himself has 8.4 million followers. The liberals have the largest Twitter following compared to the other parties. Again, the PM has more on his own account than all parties combined, and then some. The NDP leads for Instagram. Again, Prime Minister leads all combined with his own account. And this really, in some means, the Liberals have a direct line to a substantially larger audience via social media than any of the other parties. But if we look even further into this and what it tells us, just adding to that a little bit more. So the Conservatives leading on Facebook are in front of an audience that is largely boomers, still reaching the 25 to 34 core, uh, but skewing older. Liberals leading in Twitter are getting Gen X and millennial, and that's where the 30 to 49 year old group is largest. And the NDP leading on Instagram are in front of 25 to 34 year olds, with it being a leading platform also for teens, so getting incoming voters. It's also worth noting that with the Liberals and the PM on Snapchat, we're talking about a, a large range of 13 to 34 year olds, and TikTok largely 10 to 19 year olds, followed by 16 to 24 year olds. So these are future and new voters. Finally, just estimated, 
uh, the number that, uh, of social media users in Canada since 2019 has increased from approximately 25 million to, to 32 million. So a much bigger audience at play across a variety of platforms for all parties to consider in this election. And if I circle back to where we started this, it really just means that there are more avenues to listen for information and sentiment that can inform and impact your own efforts short-term and long-term. All these social media platforms have key health newsmakers, reporters, influencers, and communities. This is a prime opportunity for social listening to, to, to active engagement. Again, all depending on what you can or cannot do at this time. And finally, these are engagement platforms. They're not broadcast media. So it will be interesting to see what evolves in the month ahead. These platforms represent a massive audience that may or may not be engaged on the issues directly, but the social media communities that they are part of, the accounts they interact with or that resonate strongly for them may well be. And that's a space for influence. I'm gonna throw it back over to you, Peter. Well, um, uh, the team, Stefan, can, Laura can help with this, uh, this next section, but if we, if we just flip to our kind of uh, closing thoughts, um, and we're happy to take questions and I've been typing away uh, and, and if I didn't answer it well, feel free to uh, give it another shot at, at my sometimes small brain, I apologize. But um, four kind of clear takeaways from our, our, our standpoint is this is, we're very early into a very short campaign. Um, the number of variables uh, that the governing party uh, could not account for when they called this election uh, are, are, are are high. Um, it is concerning how the Delta variant could play itself out. Um, when you launch a campaign, you cannot um, uh, you cannot count on or 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 expect or plan for uh, stories like we saw in Afghanistan. Even though that that probably should have been expected from the government standpoint. Um, I think I think the how school plays itself out in the first week of the campaign will be a dynamic that. Uh, that we will have to see. I think I think mandatory vaccinations you'll see crop back up in this campaign, um, and you cannot you cannot count uh, take out um, uh, sorry you cannot um, uh, forget about how important campaigning itself is and how they respond to these variables on a daily basis. Uh, yesterday's example of the prime minister responding to a question around monetary policy is a really good example of how uh, uh, the campaign may feel strong and confident. But if you slip up on, on issues that crop up during the day, it can it can throw your whole day off, or uh, or keep the momentum the momentum moving in the wrong direction. I don't know, uh, Steph or Laura, if you want to add anything in on there. I would just I would just add that you know each party launched their sort of campaigns a little differently, and keeping in mind the potential of a fourth wave and and the impacts of the the Delta variant, the Conservatives have been utilizing sort of their um, virtual uh, stage in Ottawa quite a bit. Now they did launch a, a plane and uh, you know a tour later in the week, but I think that it, it will be interesting to see how they shift from traditional campaigning, uh, if necessary, um, you know, to to a totally virtual uh, election campaign. Also, what does that mean for for voting day and the impacts if schools are closed um, and uh, the impacts on elections Canada um, and and all of that? I think it's going to it's going to depend on the pandemic, but it's it's you know likely to see a very low voter turnout. Yeah, Moving towards, added, oh, go ahead, Laura. Sorry, no, that, and just adding to, to that step, uh, you know, keeping in mind that that we do have these uh, core audiences and in sort of key audiences that they are speaking to within their own platforms. That if we are dealing with a largely virtual, uh, you know, type of landscape trying to break out of not speaking to the same cohort over and over again. You know, how do you start to get in front of another audience? Because if we look at who each party is speaking to, they're largely within a very specific grouping. In terms of what the government could look like, majority or minority, um, uh, well, I, I, would say, I would say one thing here. If the, if the election were held today, based on the polling today, and if the polling's accurate, a lot of ifs, um, the Liberals would probably still form a, a minority government. Um, last time, 2019, the Conservatives comfortably won the popular vote. Um, I mean, comfortably, it was it was by around a point. 
uh, and and the Liberals still won substantially more seats than them. And that's that's why it gets difficult when you're looking at polling and you don't look at the regional uh, regional numbers. If if the Liberals are are comfortably in the lead in, in BC, Ontario, and Quebec, um, they they could form a huge huge government uh, if only because the Conservatives lead by such a astronomical amount uh, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and uh, and Manitoba. Um, the the point that we reiterate. Um, that Steph was making at the beginning, um, campaigns matter. And the last week of, of the federal liberals campaign, uh, I think it's been a pretty, frankly, lazy uh, showing. Uh, and it's it's reflecting the polls already. Uh, Aaron O'Toole is, is competitive. Uh, and anything anything could happen in this campaign. It is it is not the uh, the cakewalk that that some may have expected it to be. Uh, though I think any of us who've worked on a number of campaigns fully expected that the the polls would tighten, that the Liberals, you know, six, seven, eight point, nine point lead was was going to shrink regardless. It should not be of comfort that it shrank as quickly as it did in the first week of the campaign. Steph, Laura, any anything further? It'll be interesting to see that sort of the 56% of Canadians that I mentioned at the beginning that don't even think it's the time to have an election, you know, what are, what are they thinking? Are, is the sort of narrative of the, the election costing 610 million to, to function, is that making a difference to them? Will they even turn out to vote? Who are they voting for? Like, I think this is, a, there's a lot of unknowns that, um, you know, we typically don't go into an election with, all based on sort of the uh, domestic climate right now, just with everything else going on. In terms of what the ballot, oh, go ahead, Laura, sorry. No, and I just think it will be interesting to watch the secondary and tertiary narratives and stories that come out from from uh, from outside of the conversation that inform the ways that that the public are are looking at this. Yeah, I agree. Um, in terms of the ballot box question, uh, Steffler, you guys you guys might have some thoughts in terms of what it is, but I'm I'm just reading the Q and A, and and John asked about. Um, surgical wait times and if it will be a topic during the campaign. Um, at, a, at the highest level, I don't actually think there's a clear-cut ballot box question yet. I think the ground is very fertile for the um, opposition parties uh, or any of the parties, I should say, to define what the ballot box question is because I don't think it's yet being cast. Uh, and I don't think it will be cast until there's some clear wedge issues or difference, differences established between the parties. Um, Though I couldn't agree more, uh, John, about the issue of surgical wait times and the issue of um, the health care that we traditionally provide needing some level of improvement, let alone the um, additional health care services uh, governments may, may want to provide. Um, but health is top of, top of um, uh, Canadians' concerns. The economy is top of Canadians' concerns. Um, I think vaccinations is going to come back up. Uh, but we have yet to understand what the defining issue of the campaign is yet, um, which only speaks to the fact that there's a lot of campaign uh, to come. Laura, Steph? No, um, I, com I completely agree with you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, Steph, why don't you, why don't you tackle the, the, the last one there? Because I know that was one that you were putting some thought into. Yeah, and I think we had a few questions just about what FPT means. So federal, provincial, territorial uh, dynamics, very different compared to 2019. Um, you know, I think just in the last week alone, we've seen a little bit of a calmer um, environment uh, just from the, the provinces engaging in any sort of election uh, banter. And a lot of that has to do with the child care agreements um, in conservative provinces that were that were sort of rushed out in the last week leading up to the election. Um, and also a, a truce in place with uh, Ontario and, and the, the PC, you know, Ford government, which is um, really interesting to see. So, you know, I think the provinces are relying a lot on the federal government these days um, for, for everything. And uh, so it's going to be, it's, it's interesting to watch the dynamics, but it's very quiet compared to 2019. Um, and uh, I, I would just add, you know, the point that I made at the beginning around the Nova Scotia election, how does that impact um, this election? And really just, I don't think we know yet. Um, you know, I think the polling over the next sort of week or two will really be telling on that. Peter, anything else you want to add? 
Well, maybe on Nova Scotia, um, the the Nova Scotia election um, uh, is a very local election. You know, the reason why the Conservatives uh, won in Nova Scotia is probably better understood by Nova Scotians. There, uh, you know, you had a Liberal leader, frankly, who had uh, two DUIs and was in hiding most of the campaign for firing a female candidate and a couple of very high profile healthcare issues that cropped up during the campaign that re really define the need for change. Um, without a doubt, without a doubt, though, uh, a, a liberal government going conservative at the beginning of the campaign will have um, implications for the Liberal Party outside of Quebec. And uh, you would imagine that uh, anybody in that central campaign right now, it, it should it should rightfully make them nervous uh, and get them up on their toes to be um, to be more aggressive. So to Seth's point, I'm not sure exactly how it'll play out. Um, but it's definitely, it should without a doubt be a, a cause for worry that incumbent governments are not, uh, are not protected. So we got a bunch of questions. Um, Steph, Laura, how do you, how do you want to tackle them at this point? Um, Cause there's some that some of us might be more apt to answer uh, than others. So uh, John on surgical wait times, I think we tried, tried to address that. I, I think there will need to be some federal money to address it. Um, it has not teased itself out as of yet um, in any of the platform campaigns. And, and I'd say that there's some broader health issues that, that have yet to be defined. I don't know if Steph, Laura, you have any further comments on that one? No. Um, uh, pa Emily asked about the Bloc Québécois in Quebec. Um, I think the, the Liberals, uh, one of the reasons they didn't get the majority in 2019 is because uh, the bloc surged in 2019 in Quebec. Um, so if they've learned their lesson, uh, they will put a strong focus on Quebec that if they have any slight lead, they will work uh, to maintain it. But but yes, that's that's exactly what happened in 2019 and it, and it could happen to them again. Uh, the Liberals have to perform well. They have to maintain uh, what they have out East. Uh, they need to maintain a, a slight lead in Quebec. Uh, they need to have a insurmountable lead in Ontario, uh, and they need to comfortably have a couple points on the three-way race in BC uh, to get 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 to a majority government, and it and it will all hinge on uh, on uh, on less than a dozen seats, uh, uh, even less than that. I think Peter, I can take the next two questions Go for it. from John. It, it's uh, how harmful has the People's Party been to the Conservatives? I would say uh, n not harmful at all. And I would say if this was, uh, you know, 2019, maybe we were expecting more from from Max and uh, and his party. But in this election, um, you know, not even on the radar. Um, and I think you also asked if Aaron O'Toole seems to be courting social conservatives more. It's been an interesting balance watching that, um, you know, taking, taking his new role as the leader. There were uh, a few sort of big social conservative issues, uh, you know, managing the, the Derek Sloan issue um, right off the bat as a new leader. Did that alienate some of his caucus in Alberta? Yes, definitely. Was there a lot of infighting going on sort of around the party, um, uh, the party convention and uh, the national council races and stacking those with uh, sort of the traditional social conservatives? Uh, yes. Um, so it, it is interesting to see. Um, and, you know, even in the last week or so, the, the conservative headquarters put out this really um, odd sort of uh, ad on social media, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory ad, and you had MPs from specifically from Alberta, you know, commenting on to CPC HQ to remove that, that video and who had the authority to do that. So I think there's still a lot of internal sort of uh, dynamics happening at into John's point, you know, um, it's a balance always. Uh, it's a it's a big blue tent, and so balancing between the sort of fiscal red Tories and the the the, the traditional social conservatives is always very difficult to do. Um, Louise is asking about how indigenous health issues and and their impact in the campaign. Um, uh, I think that I think that these will be um, very important issues in a number of ridings, particularly in Northern Ontario, Northern Quebec, Nunavut, um, uh, some ridings in BC and Saskatchewan. Um, so they're, they're almost localized national issues. 
Um, I think the NDP and the uh, liberals alike will, will put a strong focus on uh, what they believe and what they will do. Um, uh, I don't know if, if others have, it, have any other thoughts uh, because uh, it has been a really um, traumatizing and uh, eye awakening couple of months uh, for a lot of people who are not aware of Canada's history. Um, do I think it will be a ballot box question? Um, probably not. How or should it be? I don't know. Yeah, I'm just a little bit surprised that we haven't seen more from the other parties on it um, at this point. So it'll be interesting to see. But it's early days. Um, so I, I think maybe Laura, this might question might be uh, best best put to you. If the candidate or elected official share a positive message about our issue organization, do election rules prevent us from liking, retweeting, highlighting, and supporting? Oh, actually, maybe that's more question for Steph. I apologize. Um, I I would just be uh, very very cautious. Depending if you're a registered charity, they have some pretty strong rules in terms of partisan activity. Um, the the rules are in a, a bit of a, a gray area in terms of how you can tweet. Um, but if you're a registered charity, my, my sense is, and you will have lawyers who can give you a much better sense, uh, is that you should not be seen to be supporting any particular um, party's individual policy to leave the impression that you're supporting a particular policy. So tread carefully on that. If you're, if you're not um, in the registered charity world, uh, that is up to your own corporate guidelines in terms of what you want to do. A lot of, uh, a lot of organizations um, uh, actually trade quite productively on the ability to endorse certain policies that uh, that will speak to their business interests or members or whatever it is. Um, so outside of uh, whatever the um, rules are in which you are governed uh, by, by the CRA, um, that will really come down to your own organization's guidelines and comfort level and, and risk and opportunity assessment. Um, Steph, you, you may have something to add there. The only other thing I would add is if you are a registered uh, lobbyist uh, in-house uh, for your organization, anything that is um, a communication on social media. So if you're tweeting at a specific, uh, you know, candidate or, uh, well, it would have to be an elected official MP, um, that can be uh, considered grassroots lobbying. Um, so just make sure if you're, if you are registered as an in-house lobbyist that you have that checked off. We'll give the opportunity for any um, uh, any final questions to come in. Uh, but Steph or Laura, do you have any any closing thoughts before we wrap up and and address any any final questions that might emerge? No, I think it's going to be an interesting few weeks to watch, and a lot still to to come, and a, a lot you know in, in terms of uh, kids going back to school and uh, monitoring the impacts of COVID on this uh, election. Um, I think there's just a, a lot still to happen. Yeah, echoing what Steph has said, the impacts of COVID, so much has changed from 2019 to 2021, uh, the issues that are at hand now and the ways in which those issues are being communicated and engaged on. It's, it's going to be very interesting in the weeks ahead. Thanks, Laura. And thanks, Steph. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I did see one question in here. Yes, you can rewatch the webinar. We're going to post it all online and you'll get an email with it as well, too. Um, on behalf of myself, uh, uh, Laura, Steph, and the, the whole dynamic team here at Santa's who is obsessed and love uh, elections, thanks for joining us today. Feel free to reach out and, uh, uh, and thanks for allowing a, a brief appearance for my dogs on this webinar as well too. Uh, have yourself a, a, safe, a safe Thursday and a safe uh, weekend and, and look forward to um, uh, connecting with you all soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you.